Hello, and welcome back. I'm Professor John Blakeman from the UW Stevens Point Political Science Department, and this is my ongoing lecture series on the U.S. Constitution, sponsored by the UWSP Alumni Association and their alumni college experience. So this is lecture number 11, called the prize cases. And remember, lectures 10, 11, and 12, we are looking at presidential power, and especially presidential power in times of national crisis. So lecture 10, just briefly, remember, we looked at an interesting case, Ex parte Merriman, which concerned whether President Lincoln during the Civil War could order the detention of Confederate sympathizers. And in that case, we didn't necessarily get a very clear answer, or at least not in the outcome of the case. Lecture 11 is called the prize cases. And the prize cases also occur during the Civil War, and the question is whether President Lincoln can order a naval blockade of southern ports and seize ships trying to run the blockade. Now, the prize cases are several cases lumped together that the Supreme Court accepted for review, and they all concern ship owners who have lost their ships in the blockade and they have turned around and they have sued the federal government for some kind of compensation. There were a lot of these cases coming into the federal court system in 1862, 1863, 1864, and even for a handful of years after the Civil War is over. So this turns out to be a fairly significant constitutional issue for federal courts to deal with. And in the prize cases, the Supreme Court opinion, the US Supreme Court essentially tells us what the Constitution will allow. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, there are a lot of cases like this in the federal court system. Ship owners who have had their shipping seized by the federal Navy and condemned, that is auctioned off the ship itself, perhaps repurposed. And so a lot of the litigants are looking for compensation. Their property was taken, as they see it, perhaps in violation of the Fifth Amendment takings clause, and they would like the federal government to compensate them for that. Now, at the crux of their argument is often the assertion that the president acted unconstitutionally, that President Lincoln has no authority to order a blockade on southern ports. Only Congress could do that. And the argument there is essentially that a blockade is an act of war, and so therefore it must be something that only Congress can authorize, since only Congress can take us into a war, essentially. Now, the Supreme Court is very divided on this, five to four. Justice Greer writes the majority opinion, and he says right away that the right of prize and capture has its origin in the jus belli and is governed and adjudged under the law of nations. Now, what Justice Greer means is the jus belli, that's the laws of war under the laws of nations, under international law. And the laws of war recognize the right of prize and capture between belligerents. So when two countries are at war with each other, they are belligerents. They have the right to seize and capture neutral vessels that might be aiding the other side. Justice Greer points out a war must exist de facto, in fact. That's an important distinction. A war, in fact, might be different than um, a war in law, a war de juris. And a war, in fact, is basically, the fact is this, two countries are at war with each other. A war in law is where one or both countries have officially declared war against each other. And you might think this is a silly little distinction. Of course, wars exist, in fact, and, and yes, they do. But whether 
the United States is at war with the Confederacy or not, whether Congress has declared war or the president has simply asserted that we are in a conflict, that might actually matter. Now, Justice Greer goes on, um, and he, he recognizes that by the Constitution, Congress alone has the power to declare a national or foreign war, a war in law where Congress uses its constitutional authority to formally declare war against another country. The Constitution confers on the president the whole executive power. And so the president cannot declare a war. That belongs to Congress. But the president is bound to take care that the laws be executed. He's commander in chief of the army and navy, so on and so forth. But up here, it gets really interesting. And this is where the prize cases are very, very important for modern presidential power. If a war be made by invasion of a foreign nation, a foreign nation is invading the United States, for example, the president is not only authorized, but bound to resist force by force. He does not initiate the war. He can't declare the war. He hasn't started the war, but is bound to accept the challenge without waiting for any legislative authority. And whether the hostile party be a foreign invader or states in rebellion, it is nonetheless a war. This is where that de facto war point is very, very prominent. But think about this. If a war be made by invasion of a foreign nation on the United States or states organized in rebellion, the president is not only authorized by the Constitution and by federal law, but bound, obligated to resist force by force. The president didn't start the war, but the president must accept the challenge without waiting for Congress. So Justice Greer is identifying sort of an independent source of presidential power here that arises only when the United States is invaded or states are in rebellion. Now, we might be able to extend the principle to other times of national crisis, too. That's going to be tricky. But nonetheless, given these circumstances, invasion by a foreign nation or states in rebellion, it is nonetheless a war. It is a war in fact, and the president is bound to respond, and he does not have to wait for any congressional authority. The president can act on his own. And Justice Greer goes on, where the president fulfilling his duties as commander in chief in suppressing an insurrection has met with such armed hostile resistance and a civil war of alarming proportions as will compel him to uh, accord to them the states in rebellion, the character of belligerence. It is a question to be decided by him. And this court must be governed by the decisions and acts of the political departments. He must determine what degree of force the crisis demands. The proclamation of blockade is itself official and conclusive evidence to the court that a state of war existed. Now, that's the heart of the prize case opinion right there. When the president fulfilling his duties as commander in chief in suppressing an insurrection or or meeting a foreign invasion into the United States, for that matter. And he has met with armed resistance. And he has declared the other side belligerents, people who are at war with us. It is a question to be decided by the president himself. And the court must accept the president's determination. He must determine what degree of force the crisis demands. That is so important in this case. The president determines 
what degree of force the crisis demands. And the court must accept that. The blockade itself, the proclamation of a blockade, is official and conclusive evidence that a state of war existed. So the president is not declaring war. Only Congress can do that. The president is responding to an armed rebellion. He has determined that the other side are belligerents. Only the president can make that determination. And the court must respect that. And only the president can determine what degree of force the crisis demands why the prize cases are so important. Many presidents since Abraham Lincoln have gravitated to this phraseology. The president must determine what degree of force the crisis demands. The president must determine the nature of the belligerents in rebellion or engaged in an act of war against the United States. There's no declaration of war by Congress but the president has some independent power, an inherent power in a sense, that comes out of the office of the presidency. The president has the inherent power to respond to a crisis, to respond against force, with force, and to essentially determine the degree or the amount of force required as a response. And the Supreme Court must accept it. Now, uh, you know, put this in perspective for you. After the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the Bush administration, uh, lawyers in the Bush White House, gravitated to the prize cases to establish a, a constitutional basis for the broad exercise of presidential authority as a response to al-Qaeda and the ongoing war on terrorism. President Bush wasn't the first president to do that. Several presidents throughout the 20th century sort of used the prize cases uh, and this principle that president must determine what degree of force is required. Many presidents in the 20th century gravitated to that principle to justify um, and explain their use of force against threats to the national security of the United States. So the prize cases, the, the, ju the five justice majority here is incredibly important. The principles that Justice Greer has set down are incredibly important. Now, one, one confusion though, to go back to the very beginning, constitutional historians still puzzle over why Justice Greer immediately jumped to the law of nations, to international law. Um, he probably did that because he perceived the presidency as, as the figurehead for the United States. And as the figurehead, there's something inherent about the sovereignty of the United States as a nation that leads to the presidential authority to respond in times of crisis. But, but it's still a puzzle why Justice Greer relied on international law to help him develop the parameters of presidential power and not the Constitution only. Now, let me skip ahead to the dissent. Four justices dissented. Uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney is in the dissent interestingly enough. And the crux of the dissenting opinion is when Lincoln issued his blockade order against southern ports, Congress had not met, Congress had not declared war. Since Congress had not declared war, the president had no authority to blockade ships coming in and out of those ports, even though the southern states were in rebellion. As the four justices in dissent see it, the Constitution here is clear. Congress must declare war, or at least recognize the rebellion as a rebellion, and then President Lincoln can act. 
So as the dissent points out, we have thus far been speaking of the war power under the Constitution and as known and recognized by the law of nations. But we are asked, what would become of the peace and integrity of the Union in case of an insurrection at home or invasion from abroad if this power could not be exercised by the president in the recess of Congress? The framers fully comprehended this question as the dissent puts it, and provided for the contingency. Indeed, it would have been surprising if they had not, as a rebellion had occurred in Massachusetts, Shays Rebellion, remember, while the convention was in session, and which had become so general that it was quelled only by calling out the military power of the state. The Constitution declares that Congress shall have power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union in times of insurrection and to repel invasions. So the Constitution is clear there. Whatever its numbers, whatever great or small that may be required, ample provision is made here. And whether great or small, the nature of the power is the same. It is the exercise of a power under the municipal laws of the country. By municipal laws, the dissent means the domestic laws, the Constitution, not international law, the municipal laws of the country and not under the law of nations. And as we see, furnishes the most ample means of repelling attacks. So as the dissent sees it, this isn't left to question. Congress has the authority here that until the assembling of Congress who can, if it be deemed necessary, bring into operation the war power and thus change the nature of the contest, instead of being carried on under the municipal law of 1795, where Congress empowered the executive branch to use the militia when needed to uh, deal with an insurrection, it would be under the law of nations and the act of Congress's war measures with all the rights of war. The justices and dissent are just perplexed by Justice Greer's jump to international law. But more importantly, um, the dissent makes an interesting point at the end. So the war carried on by the president against the insurrectionary districts in the southern states, as in the case of the king of Great Britain in the American Revolution, was a personal war against those in rebellion and with encouragement and support of loyal citizens with a view to their cooperation in suppressing the insurgents with a difference as the war-making power belonged to the king, he might have recognized or declared the war at the beginning to be a civil war, which would draw after it all the rights of a belligerent. But in the case of the president, no such power existed. The war, therefore, from necessity, was a personal war until Congress assembled and acted. Now, what the dissenting opinion means by that. When Lincoln acted on his own and ordered the blockade, he was no different than the British monarch. Under, under English common law, the British monarch has the sole authority to declare war. Now, of course, in this day and age, and in fact, back in, um, the time of the American Revolution too, the British Parliament would declare war, but it was still considered uh, an act of the monarch, an act of the king. And the war was considered a personal war in a sense. And the dissent point out that we don't have that in our constitutional tradition. There's no sense of the American president being able to wage war even against insurrectionary districts in the southern states. The president has federal law to rely on to call out the militia. Congress has empowered him to do that. 
But the president can't go beyond that. And for President Lincoln to order a blockade and to engage in a larger act of war makes Lincoln's conduct a personal war, a personal war and not a war as allowed under our constitutional system. That's fairly strong rhetoric. The dissents, dissenting justices are suggesting, uh, or no, not suggesting, they're accusing Lincoln of acting on his own and waging war on his own without any input from Congress. And as they see it, that is unconstitutional. Now, the prize cases present a couple of very big dilemmas for us. There will most certainly, certainly be times, times of crisis, where the president must act and Congress is out of session and Congress cannot quickly come into session to authorize the president to do something. Now, in this day and age, Congress can come into session very, very quickly. No question about that. In 1861, it would take weeks for Congress to assemble. So in 1861, maybe it's a little different. President Lincoln did have to act more on his own at the earlier stages of, of, of the Civil War. Whereas post 9-11, certainly uh, any American president can rely on Congress to come back quickly and empower him to do certain things. But the dilemma is still there, that there will be times of crisis where the president must act on his own and this is where we encounter questions about what constitutional authority the president has to act without some kind of input from Congress. Now, another dilemma is this, uh, and, and this is raised more by the dissenting opinion, which, um, you know, by, by saying that President Lincoln was waging a personal war and that only Congress could assemble and declare war and then authorize a blockade. The dissenting justices are, in a sense, judging presidential power relative to Congress. And there's nothing wrong with that. Certainly Congress does have the authority to empower the president to do certain things. And the president's authority is contingent, to a certain extent, on congressional approval. But to what extent? That's the dilemma. The other dilemma, I should say. To what extent are we going to require the president to act with congressional approval in times of national crisis? Because the more we require the president to act according to the approval of Congress, the more limits we place on presidential power. The less we require the president to act with congressional approval, the more power we give to the president to act on his own. Or as the majority in the prize cases put it, the more power the president has to determine what degree of force is needed to meet force. Or to maybe paraphrase that, the, the power of the president to determine the extent of a national crisis and the extent of a response that is required. The Constitution doesn't really give us a, an easy answer to this. Absolutely. And, and in the 20th century, especially in the post-World War II era, as national security issues are, are prominent in American foreign policy, we see the need for the president to act independently to meet crisis after crisis without necessarily having to wait for congressional approval or congressional guidance. Anyway, it's tricky. The Constitution here isn't all that clear. And as our history shows, we do tend to approve of the president's expansion of force or power, I should say, uh, the president's expansion of his own power to deal with national crises. Maybe Hamilton was right in that we want an energetic executive. We have an energetic executive, a president 
a presidential office that has the power to respond to crisis, um, crises, I should say, as they come up. The Constitution isn't silent, but the Constitution doesn't give us a lot of clear guidance on this. Now, the last case on presidential power, Youngstown, Sheedon II versus Sawyer. If you haven't read it, take a look at it and especially pay attention to Justice Robert Jackson's concurring opinion, which I will focus a lot of attention on when we get to the case in the next lecture, because Justice Jackson gives us a, a methodology or a framework for judging presidential power in times of crisis. And the framework does seem to make sense. Okay, well, I'll see you then. Thank you.